Hi, my name is Scott Simpson, and this lecture will be discussing relevant anatomy on the frontal view of the chest. When discussing radiographic anatomy, there are two key principles we first have to understand. First, where do the normal anatomical structures lie in relation to each other? Second, knowing where they are located, how do they appear in chest x-ray? That is, what contours, opacities, and lucencies do they actually create? The anatomy we will be focusing on this lecture are related to the airways, cardiovascular structures, lungs and pleura, and bones. Let's first discuss the airways, where we will be focusing on the trachea, carina, main stem airways, and the bronchus intermedius. So this is a normal frontal view of the chest. The airways are air-filled and therefore will appear black. The first structure we have to talk about is the trachea, which is seen here, extending from the neck into the mediastinum. The inverted V-shaped portion of the trachea, where the trachea divides into the right and left main stem bronchi, is known as the carina, which is seen here. Let's first talk about the right-sided airways. So the very short and vertically oriented airway here is known as the right main stem bronchus. Notice the very short and vertically oriented course. This is frequently why endotracheal tubes, when placed too low, end up on the right side, or when you aspirate something, it goes into the right lung. It's the orientation of the right main stem airway. Also notice the right upper lobe bronchus. The right upper lobe bronchus comes off almost immediately from the right main stem airway and appears very horizontal. Just after your right upper lobe bronchus, we see the bronchus intermedius. The bronchus intermedius, like the trachea, is very vertically oriented, which we see here. Compare this to the left side now. The left main stem airway is very long and horizontal. The right main stem airway, on the other hand, was very short and vertical. So what are the cardiovascular structures that we'll be focusing on? The first are the cardiac chambers, so right atrium and right ventricle, left atrium and left ventricle, then the aorta, so ascending aorta, aortic arch and descending aorta, the pulmonary arteries, main, left and right, and interlobar pulmonary arteries, some of the veins, SVC and IVC and azygous vein, and then we'll focus on what creates an edge or an outline of these structures. So here we'll be looking at contours and then lines and some stripes. In order to highlight the cardiovascular structures, we're gonna follow blood through the heart. The first chamber of the heart that we're gonna see where blood enters is the right atrium. Blood enters the right atrium via the SVC, as well as the IVC, which is seen more inferiorly. Notice how the right atrium will form the right cardiac contour. The SVC is often vaguely seen in the frontal view of the chest X-ray, whereas the IVC is typically not identified. Blood will then enter the right ventricle via the tricuspid valve, which is seen here in purple. Notice the midline location of the tricuspid valve, which largely overlies the spine. The tricuspid valve is typically not visible unless it has been surgically repaired. Blood is now on the right ventricle. The right ventricle is the most anterior chamber of the heart. Now notice on the frontal view, it does not typically form a contour when normal in size. Blood will leave the right ventricle via the right ventricular outflow tract, which is the most superior and tubular portion of the right ventricle, to finally exit the heart via the pulmonic valve, which is seen here in yellow. The pulmonic valve is the most superiorly located valve, which is seen to the left of midline. Blood will now enter the main pulmonary artery, seen here in dark blue. Notice how a portion of the main pulmonary artery will create a contour just below the aortic knob, which we'll, we'll discuss on subsequent slides. The main pulmonary artery then divides into the main right-sided pulmonary artery, which we see here, which is very horizontally oriented, and the left pulmonary artery, which we see here. Notice how the right main pulmonary artery sits inferior to the right main stem airway, whereas the left pulmonary artery actually goes up and over the left main stem airway. Blood will then circulate into the lungs and return to the heart via the pulmonary veins and enter the left atrium, which we see here in red. The left atrium is the most posterior cardiac chamber and like the right ventricle is generally not contour forming on the frontal view of the chest X-ray. The exception is a small portion out here called the left atrial appendage, which is located just below the main pulmonary artery. Blood will then leave the left atrium via the mitral valve, seen in purple. The location of the mitral valve is roughly the same latitude of the tricuspid valve, though more laterally located to the left. Remember, the tricuspid valve overlied the spine. Blood is now on the left ventricle, which is normally the largest and thickest chamber of the heart. Notice that the left ventricle will form the majority of the left cardiac contour. Blood then leaves the ventricle via the aortic valve, which we see here in yellow. The aortic valve is typically located at the dead center of the heart, slightly higher than the mitral and tricuspid valve planes, and just off of midline to the left. Notice the orientation of the valve, which is typically directed towards the left shoulder.
We are now entering the aorta, more specifically the ascending aorta, an anteriorly located structure. Notice how the outer edge of the ascending aorta creates a contour beginning just above the right atrium. This usually eclipses the SVC, which also lives in this area. The aorta then has a course which goes from anterior to posterior. This course, when viewed on FOSS, will appear as a circle. That is, we're looking down the tube. This represents the aortic arch, which is also called the aortic knob on chest X-ray. The aorta then descends posteriorly before leaving the chest to enter the abdominal cavity. This is called the descending aorta. Let's now review the direction of blood flow with all these structures superimposed on one another. So we said blood first enters the right atrium via the IVC and the SVC, leaves the right atrium via the tricuspid valve, which is midline, to enter the right ventricle, which is not contour forming and anteriorly located, to leave the right ventricle via the pulmonic valve, via the main pulmonary artery, and then into the right and left main pulmonary arteries. Blood then will then circulate in the lungs to return to the heart, entering the left atrium via the pulmonary veins. Again, note the left atrial appendage. Blood then leaves the left atrium via the mitral valve to enter the left ventricle. Notice how the left ventricle creates a large contour on the left side of the heart. Blood then leaves the left ventricle via the aortic valve. The ascending aorta has a course from right to left and creates this outer edge, then extends from anterior to posterior, so it appears a circle, and then descends posteriorly in the posterior mediastinum to leave the chest cavity. Since there is so much overlap, we now have to try to decipher which of these structures we can see as a contour. So the first contour we see out here is formed by the right atrium. The next contour that we see above the right atrium, remember, this is where the ascending aorta lived. This represents the ascending aorta. The next contour that we see here, the first bump on the left side of the cardiomediastinum, so the first bump that we see, this is the aortic knob. Remember, that's the portion of the aorta that goes from anterior to posterior. This typically represents the aortic arch. Just below the aortic arch, this bump that we see here, remember how the main pulmonary artery came up. So this actually represents the main pulmonary artery. The bump just below the main pulmonary artery actually reflected the left atrial appendage. Remember that small portion of the left atrium that sat out laterally. And then finally, the majority of the left heart border is formed by the left ventricle. If we subtract out the chest X-ray and subtract it out each of the labels on this figure, you should be able to correctly identify which contour is where. We can also notice some lines and stripes. The first that I typically look at is known as the right paratracheal stripe. This is the portion of the trachea that interfaces with the lung and mediastinum. Another contour or stripe or line that we may see, this is known as the AP window, aortopulmonary window. This is a concavity just below the aortic knob between the aortic knob and the main pulmonary artery. Normally, there should be a concavity. We could also see another stripe seen extending from the aortic knob inferiorly. This represents the outer edge of the descending thoracic aorta. This is what's known as the descending aortic stripe. Notice how there is an ovoid structure sitting just above the origin of the right main stem airway. This represents the azygous vein. The azygous vein has a course from inferior to superior in the posterior mediastinum, which then extends over the right main stem airway to enter the SVC. The visible hilar structures are mainly composed of veins and arteries, with the larger vessels representing the pulmonary arteries. We already discussed the right and left pulmonary arteries seen here. The most medial branch, which we could sometimes see, represents the upper lobe pulmonary arteries, this is also known as the truncus anterior. Almost always visible are the intralobar pulmonary arteries, which are these finger-like inferiorly directed projections. The intralobar pulmonary arteries, also known as the descending pulmonary arteries, supply the lower and middle lobes. So let's now move on to the lungs and pleura. The right lung has three lobes, upper, middle, and lower, separated by two fissures, the major or oblique, and the minor or horizontal. The left lung has two lobes, the upper and lower, and one fissure, the major or oblique. Let's now talk about the fissures. The fish, first fissure that we're going to talk about is the right major fissure, which is easy to see in the lateral view. Because it's obliquely oriented, we typically do not see it on the frontal view. Arising from the major fissure, 
anteriorly is the right minor fissure. Notice the very horizontal course. This is why it's called the horizontal fissure. Because the horizontal fissure is something that can project on FOSS on a frontal view, we sometimes see it as a thin line. These fissures then separate the right lung into different lobes. Notice how the right upper lobe is anteriorly located above the minor fissure. The right middle lobe is below the minor fissure and anterior to the major fissure. And then the right lower lobe is the most posteriorly located um, portion of the lung within the chest cavity. Let's look at how each of these lobes then project. So the right upper lobe we can see here. Notice how the right upper lobe is always going to be above the minor fissure. The right middle lobe is below the minor fissure and anterior to the major fissure. Notice the large surface of contact it has with the heart. The right lower lobe, while it appears to contact a portion of the heart on the frontal view, mainly contacts the diaphragm. Notice how the right lower lobe contacts the diaphragm. The right lower lobe is the most posterior structure in the heart. Also notice on the frontal view how the right lower lobe extends above and below the minor fissure. Now when we superimpose these structures on each other, we can see that there's quite a bit of overlap. This is important because in a frontal view of the chest without the lateral correlate, it's sometimes hard to localize which lobe something is actually in. So notice a nodule, which we see here in red. We don't know which lobe it's in. We could say it's in the mid lung zone or upper lung zone, but it's hard to know which lobe. So what we have to do is look on the lateral view. It's above the minor fissure. So since it's above the minor fissure, we know that it's either on the right upper or right lower lobe. We localize it on the lateral view and we can see that it's located in the right upper lobe. But notice this nodule could have also been more posteriorly located in the right lower lobe. Let's now talk about the left side. So on the left side, we only have one fissure. This is the left major fissure or the oblique fissure. Notice again how an oblique fissure is not going to be seen in the frontal view of the chest. This divides the left lung into the left upper and left lower lobes. The left upper lobe spans most of the chest cavity. Notice on the frontal view how it goes almost from the lung apex almost all the way down to the diaphragm. The left lower lobe contacts the diaphragm and extends pretty far superiorly. You then can notice how there's so much overlap between these lobes. The same holds true on the right. If we have a nodule, it's hard to know exactly where that nodule is located because there's so much overlap. We say that this nodule is in the upper lung zone and have to look at the lateral view. On the lateral view, we can see that this nodule could be in the superior segment of the left lower lobe, or it could be within the left upper lobe. So again, we really need that lateral view to tell us where something is actually located. Lastly, let's move on to the bones and soft tissues. The first bone that we see out here extending from the midline laterally, this is the clavicle. The clavicle then connects to the scapula via the acromion process. This whole thing represents the scapular body. In the midline, we notice these rectangles. These rectangles are the vertebral bodies. Arising from the vertebral bodies extending posteriorly are the pedicles. And the reason why they appear circular is because you're looking at them on FOSS. In the midline, we notice, notice these oblong shaped structures. These are the spinous processes. These are the most posterior aspects of the vertebral bodies. They appear ovoid because they are elongated structures that we're looking at on FOSS. We could also notice the ribs. This portion of the rib is the posterior portion of the rib. This is the posterior rib. This is the portion that contacts the vertebral body. The rib then swings anteriorly. This represents the anterior rib. Notice how the very anterior aspects of the ribs are not seen. This is because they're cartilaginous. So in summary, we looked at the airways, the trachea and central airways, the cardiomediastinum, as well as the contours that they had created, the hilum, where the pulmonary arteries and interlobar pulmonary arteries lived, the lungs and fissures, specifically the lobes and the fissures, and then finally the bones. If there's any questions, please feel free to email me at scott.simpson at uphs.upenn.edu.